The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. I'm your host, Jackson, and in today's episode, I'm speaking to Dr. Alex Sesser all about his latest blog post on the History with Jackson website, Pearl Harbor and the Fight for Freedom, the Loss of a Generation. This is a really interesting piece of memory studies and a look into the effect of Pearl Harbor and its impact on the American psyche for generations. Now, I know you're going to enjoy this. I know you're going to enjoy reading it as well on the website. And if you want to continue learning history outside of our podcast episodes, do head to the History Jackson website to read all the other amazing blog pieces we have on there. Now, without further ado, I'll leave you with Alex. So hello and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. Today, we welcome historian Dr. Alex Sesser to talk about his latest blog post, which is on the History of Jackson website, Pearl Harbor and the Fight for Freedom, the Loss of a Generation. Now this is, and I know it might be slightly biased, it is on my website, but it is an awesome article and I'm really looking forward to discussing it with you today, Alex. So how are you? Yeah, not too bad. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. And I'm excited to discuss some of the themes and ideas and concepts that you put in this article because it really is an interesting read. Well, thank you. Thank you, and I had, I had quite a bit of fun writing it too. Um, and you'll you'll probably you'll probably note I'm not a historian of of Pearl Harbor or of the Second World War. I focus more on uh, the Holocaust and and memory studies in general. Uh, but this was something I, uh, I I really wanted to write about and talk about. So that gives me the perfect segue to my first question, really, Alex. You know, what was the the inspiration behind writing this post? Because memory studies isn't an area that an awful philosophers are particularly familiar with and it is a growing area within history mm. yeah I, I well i was really i felt inspired because you know as we recently passed the the 82nd anniversary of the attack on pearl harbor this this past december i, I started to ask myself who's left you know who can really tell these stories and and i guess you know who is going to tell this story after after there is no one left to, you know, who can personally remember it, something like fewer than 2% of Americans today are able to personally remember where they were. I mean, remember my own grandmother, she used to talk about it. She remembered, uh, she was working uh, in New York City at the time. She was 18. She came home and you know, everyone was huddled around the radio. People were afraid. And, um, and I just thought that was such a powerful living memory. Um, but there's very few people who can remember that. And, and I started to ask myself, you know, what, for something that has defined, um, you know, the American psyche for so long, that has been so, that has loomed so large in American consciousness, what will the world look like when we don't remember Pearl Harbor personally? It, it's, will it be re relegated to another historical footnote? Um, Something else that stuck with me in my research was that uh, I know at Pearl Harbor, uh, survivors themselves used to give tours to visitors, um, and that's no longer possible. Uh, the youngest survivor of Pearl Harbor is now 99 years old, uh, and there's only an estimated 25 survivors left today. So we're really facing a world in which it, the attack on Pearl Harbor is outside of living memory. Yeah, I can certainly see how it would be difficult for a 99 year old to give a tour of, of Pearl Harbor mm. but you say a really nice point there about Pearl Harbor being something that, that looms large in the American psyche the American mm. consciousness and, and is often used for a for a byword for international terrorism or international tax on America mm. but not every listener uh, of this podcast is American or is familiar with the Pacific theater uh, mm. a lot of European studies into World War II focus on what happens on the European fronts and, mm. and and sometimes the Eastern Front. So could you tell us in a in a roundabout way what happens and what was Pearl Harbor and what happened during the attack? So there was tension uh, between the United States and Japan, although the United States was neutral. Uh, they were giving materials to uh, to the Allies, including China. China and Japan had been at war since 1937. Um, so there was growing tension between the United States and Japan. Uh, 
Japan desperately needed uh, wartime materials that they frankly could not get from their own country. So they wanted to expand south in the Pacific. Now, American interests, and namely American alliances with um, Great Britain and the Netherlands, would have made that difficult. So Japan effectively tried to knock the United States out of um, out of that equation. Uh, and to do this, they wanted to immobilize the United States naval forces at Pearl Harbor. So at about 7.55 a.m. on the morning of December 7th, the attack came in several waves. They attacked over 180 aircraft, and they either severely damaged or destroyed uh naval capabilities on the island. Uh, The largest loss of life occurred on the USS Arizona with an astonishing 1,100 men, more than 1,100 men uh, being killed on that vessel. Something that stood out to me that out of, I think, over 37 or 38 sets of brothers, only one set of brothers survived. Uh, So this was really an event that, that... shook the American people, similar to the way that the September 11th attacks of 2001 uh, shook the American people 60 years later. In fact, I myself remember during 9-11, there was a tremendous amount of discussion about Pearl Harbor that had come up again. Uh, So Americans before December 7th had been quite divided between uh, isolationism and interventionism. And after December 7th, the United States became unified around uh, interventionism. And the United States has has never really shaken away from that uh, that stance since. So you really, the attack on Pearl Harbor is something that not only affected the outcome of the war, but it also affected, really, it affects the world that we live in today. It was really a harrowing event, you know, the Japanese Mm. attack and and facing two totalitarian, with some definitions, Imperial Japan is totalitarian, two totalitarian regimes on mm. on both sides uh, can be harrowing, but it's it's fascinating to see that there's perhaps a, a Pearl Harbor doctrine that emerges out of this attack and this Pearl Harbor psyche that's affected the American people till today. And mm. you mentioned a perhaps a positive, depending on which way you say, a positive uh, response from America and its people to this attack and that they want to go and intervene in World War II on the side of the Allies. But is there any kind of a negative response mm-hmm. from the Americans in the aftermath of this attack? So, yeah, so I, I think I think one of the most striking things about the response to uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor was the blatant racism uh, against uh, Japanese people in the United States, many of whom were American citizens, many of whom had lived and their families had lived in the United States for decades. Um, You had Executive Order 9066, which placed many Japanese people in internment camps. Uh, So touching upon that aspect uh, was very, very difficult because I wanted to craft a story that demonstrates how a generation of young Americans, you know, rose up and and responded to the threat of fascism, the threat of imperialism, the threat of national socialism. And I think in the, the context of collective memory, when we think of the Second World War, the Second World War is a little bit easier for us to understand from a morality stance than something like the First World War, which, which kind of leaves us with these very... Um, difficult and mangled kind of difficult un, and uneasy to answer questions if if that makes sense no, no i completely i completely understand where you come from that, Alex, because the first world war is a it's almost a modern world uh, war but with early modern medieval kind of lines in it and mm. political conflicts and the world trying to figure out how do you leave imperialism or Mm. Uh, how does imperialism adapt to a modern world um yeah. and, and all those all those intricacies are still involved in it but 
as you said, World War II, it's far more straightforward. But mm. with that straightforward nature, you tend to have a more simplistic look of this was good, this was bad, and 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 there, there tends to be a collective erasure of yeah. of negative actions from the Allies, such as yeah. Yeah. the internment of Sino-Americans. It's very easy to forget that history is messy, um, but I, I, so I, I struggled with that. I struggled with how we deal with race and racist responses, and unfortunately, that was a very real event that occurred um, with Pearl Harbor. Um, and it was not until 1988 that the United States, under President Reagan, formally apologized uh, to Japanese Americans for the way they were treated during the war. Um, but I, I think also, I mean, I, I think that the outcome generally was positive. More, I mean, I, I think that you know the Allies were. One doesn't want to use the, the phrase on the right side of history, but I, I think there was a, a moral imperative for the Allies to win that war. And I think that the war would have been potentially different if, if it hadn't been for U.S. entry um, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. I mean, the Japanese were hoping for a very quick, you know, just hoping to, hoping to knock the U.S. out, you know, very quick, they won't fight us, we'll get what we need from, you know, the Pacific, we'll be able to, we'll get oil, we'll get iron, we'll get rubber and coal. And, and, and for a period of time, they succeeded in their plan. Um, but what they underestimated was that the United States was very willing to fight. Um, and it, again, it was, uh, I, I, it was a period where Americans were very willing uh, to come together for a common cause. And uh, that common cause, I think, you know, I would say was really to defend their way of life, to defend their country. Um, I think people tend to forget that Americans are very, very proud and very hardworking. And I think that with Pearl Harbor, you saw a generation of people who um, embodied that. You know, they, they were tougher. They were tougher than, I think, a lot of people we see today. Um, yeah, and especially with such a, a young nation uh, mm. compared to Japan, UK, and so on, yeah. you have a, a very strong manufactured patriotism, nationalism, which is easily able. You're easily able to deploy um, to try and to try and meet your aims. But in terms of that nationalism and patriotism, then what do those American veterans of this generation and the survivors of Pearl Harbor, what do they symbolize for America, its people, and its its military? Well, I think they symbolize a generation of people who gave everything, you know, who I think that they, they really, I mean, they were a generation of people who, in many ways, they came from nothing. I mean, they, they grew up during the Depression. Um, they were not used to having very much. Um, they were very flawed people. They were people who had their own demons with race themselves, um, but very hardworking. And they came together and, and they built a nation, a new nation and a new world. Um, and that's very much the world that we live in today. I mean, the, the sort of order that we, we have today, you know, I mean, the, uh, our, our, you know, the U S Anglo Alliance, our role in NATO, um, I mean, that was all born out of the Second World War. And uh, I think that, you know, you have a, a generation of people who they were very proud to serve their country. They, they saw service as a, as a wonderful thing. I mean, my, my own grandmother, for instance, I mean, she used to work, she, she, uh, she worked at the, uh, the polling stations when people would come in to vote. Uh, she was a very big believer in volunteering, and and she she was just from that generation, just from that time when uh, you did that, when service was very important. Um, comparing that with you know generations that came after, the you know, it, it, it's just it was a different it was a different mentality, it was a different world that they they embodied, the different values they embodied, and as I said, as I said, I think frankly they were tougher. Uh, in a lot of respects, 
And I think that's where you get from uh, from Tom Brokaw his phrase, the greatest generation. It's it's interesting to see how that rep- that generation is kind of represented as the the apogee of Americanism and that beginning mm. of American hegemonic power and a new international order with America mm. as its center. It's 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 fascinating how that that generation embodies yeah. all of that. Uh, on this side of the Atlantic, you see that as well with that generation. I mean, you have attractions like Bletchley Park. You have the Cabinet War Rooms. Uh, the recently refurbished uh, Second World War exhibition at the, the Imperial War Museum. So there is still this, um, there, there, there's very much a, a romanticizing of that generation and of their service. And I think really because it's we we see the Second World War, we see it very much as, as a, a sort of clear moral uh, struggle between uh, the Allies and the Axis powers. Um, and I think in the context of memory studies, we, uh, you know, that that becomes very clear. So I don't think the fact that I've in, in many ways um, romanticized this generation uh, and their response to Pearl Harbor, that that hasn't been lost on me. Um, but I, I do believe personally that that morally that they they stood on the appropriate side of of history and that it, it we are blessed today that they were uh, they were victorious and i think part of why they were victorious was because they embraced diversity and they embraced service um whereas when you contrast that with um national socialism and fascism which you know opposed any form of you know political or ideological dissent um, I think that diversity and the spirit of di- democracy will always be stronger. That's a really nice way of, of, of discussing how, yes, it's important to safeguard the memory and protect the memory of World War II and veterans and Pearl Harbor, but to not romanticize it and discuss yeah. why memory is important today to include to include the flaws of the memory, yes. which I think is, is there's a lot of work going on about World War Two now, which is, yeah. and it's great to see that you, you carry on mm. that kind of work. And the challenge of race is, is very uh, important to that work. Uh, so I just, anyone who reads this, I, I want that just, you know, to be very clear that, you know, I am, you know, it is important to be conscious of, uh, of that fact. That really comes across in your work, Alex. And I, I, I thoroughly implore anyone to go and read, the as I said, I am biased. It is my website, but I thoroughly implore anyone to go and read the article because it does give a really interesting perspective on Pearl Harbor that decentralizes it from a, a vic- victorolic American World War Two centric perspective by including the negatives and 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 working around memory, which is really mm. interesting. But I have a final fun question for you, Alex. Yes. As we do for every guest here on the History Jackson podcast. You are a specialist in Holocaust studies, which I find absolutely fantastic. And you've written on a broad range of subjects, not just on Holocaust studies, but also on Pearl Harbor and and, and the importance of memory. Which has been your favorite piece that you've written on a topic that is not your specialism? So uh, I have two. Uh, I wrote one about, um, because I also really enjoy writing about uh, politics and you know, more, more recent things, but I wrote something on, uh, the attack on the, uh, January 6th, uh, Capitol riot. And I framed the question alongside attacks like September 11th and Pearl Harbor, how we will one day remember the attack on the Capitol, uh, because we're we're so divided now that it's it's difficult that 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 was that was an attack that was not a unifying um, moment in our history. Uh, so that was really interesting to, to to write that and to pose that question. And the other one I really enjoyed writing was um, why American presidents never attend uh, British coronations, and and not one has ever attended. Uh, and the reason that I found was because um, it's just because it's precedent. It's just because no one's ever done it and it's no one's going to start now. I think writing about politics is is really, really interesting. And, and looking at the ideas of, um, you know, I, I'm very interested in American politics as well. It's yeah. one of my 
not my specialism, but my interests, uh, and looking at the the long shadow of mm. January 6th insurrection or capital riots is is certainly something which will be interesting um, to see going into this year with the American presidential elections mm. uh, and yeah. to see who the Republicans probably choose as well. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to pick my words carefully there. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, Alex, our listeners have heard you discuss your your interest in memory studies and, and Pearl Harbor and some of the other articles and ideas that you discuss as well in your work. So where can our listeners interact with you and find your work online? Sure. So you can find me on Medium, uh, Alex Sessa 23. Uh, there is, uh, there's Instagram, there's Alex Sessa seven. You can always send me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, just, uh, Alex Sessa PhD. If you, you know, look me up there. Um, yeah, I'm fairly, fairly accessible. I'm not hard to find. <laughs> And I thoroughly look, recommend looking through Alex's Medium profile because some of the work that you put up on there, Alex, is is, is truly fascinating. And oh, it does you. change your perspective on, on some of the issues that we, we touch on. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. Now, thank you for listening to this latest episode of the History of Jackson podcast where we spoke to Dr. Alex Sessa about his latest post on the History of Jackson website, Pearl Harbor and the fight for freedom, the loss of a generation. Now, I'm sure... You can agree that memory studies is is certainly very interesting. Look at the long shadow of Pearl Harbor on the American psyche and American history was absolutely riveting, and it posed so more, so many more questions for us as well. Now, if you enjoy this episode or Alex's article or any of the content that you see here at History Jackson, please do consider supporting us to continue to do what we do already by heading to the Buy Me a Coffee profile in the description below or. Uh, subscribe to History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. Now, thank you very much for listening, and I will see you all next week when we have another awesome episode lined up for you all to learn from.